And as Dr. Juarez leaves to teach confirmation class, I invite you to turn to Revelation. We're, we're in the last half. There are seven churches. We're looking at the fourth and fifth. And next week, we'll finish with sixth and seventh. But to remind you what we've been doing, we've looked at this. Let's see now. There we go. Started right here. Okay, it's not working. Um, the Patmos in the blue. We've got Ephesus, which was the church that lost their first love. We have Smyrna. Remember, Smyrna was certainly a, a wonderful church. Uh, no condemnations, and they were told even though they're poor, they were rich in Christ. We looked at per Pergamum, the furthest north, and that is... Um, the church that compromised in their faith. And now we're going to go southeast a little bit to Thyatira. And let me see if it, okay. It's going to be, it's going to be a, I think you're going to have to change this, all right, uh, because it's not, the battery's not working. So Thyatira is the first of the churches that is in a, um, it's a plain. It's not in a defendable structure. It's just pretty much flat. You've got here a place that there were a lot of trade guilds. That's what it's known for. Sorry, this, this one here has got, let's see, I got a little flustered there. You've got trade guilds, but it's also known for being a commercial center. There's a lot of things going on here in Thyatira. It's got home also of Lydia. Do you remember we talked about Lydia a couple months ago? She's the woman who sold purple cloth and the first one that was baptized by Paul uh, in Philippi. Well, Thyatira was known for the uh, root of the matter herb and it makes red dye. And so this is where she came from, this area right here. So she certainly was wealthy and well known. So you look at a couple of pictures here, and don't know, change the next one. Where'd John go? John, can you get battery? I think it's just the battery. It's just not working. So you've got, um, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm trying to show you that there, it's a very small area in a, in a downtown city, and they're, they're, they've discovered a couple of levels, of course, and they're, having, uh, you can see they're working right now. Next slide, please. You can see right there, you can, uh, in the back, they've got an old column and they've molded it to f a new column to fit on top. That's how they make these columns five meters high because th they're all broken and they're trying to put pieces together a little close up there. Next slide. See what they're doing right there? See how it's a mold? And they're gonna put those together and you can see those columns. Those columns are the side of a street. The rest of the street goes, was destroyed because they put a road right on top of it and they dug for the foundations of the building across the street. So really they're looking at this from a very specific little area that all the rest of the city is under a city. So they can't do much to it. Next slide. Just a few examples of some of the beautiful Roman um, design. Next slide. Right there, a lot of animal features in, in this uh, time period. Now this one here is probably, with that apse, probably the synagogue. And that's one end of the synagogue. Two of our friends, uh, he's a doctor from Texas, and May is his wife. Next slide. And this is the other end. So that's a pretty large synagogue there, they think. And uh, you can see that it was half buried and they've just stopped right there. I, is that the last slide? Yeah, okay, thanks. So, so let's read the scripture. That's just a little bit of a background of this city that is um, known for its trade guilds. Reading from God's word, Thyatira. And I took a few verses out because it is the longest letter. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, 
your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. And then skipping down. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, John. Lord, once again, we open this book, this revelation, this vision of Christ, and we pray that we might be inspired to understand clearly some truth that you would have for each of us. All for your sake, we pray. Amen. So Christ begins this letter to the Christians in Thyatira with a very important, Impressive commendations. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now there's progress in this congregation. They've done commendable things. It's unlike that first church in Ephesus where those members were reprimanded for falling back in their faith. No, these have done more than what they began with. Isn't that what each of us wants to hear? Don't you want to be a different person a year from now? Just Wednesday night in our first training of our new officers, I said those same words to them. I said, I hope and pray that you will look back one year from now and that you will be deeper in your walk with Christ understanding more of his word to you and having a more fulfilling prayer life. That would be my prayer for them as it would be for all of us that we have grown in our faith, that we are doing more than we did at first. That's what Christ is telling this church. But nevertheless, it says, there must be a significant number of members in the church of Thyatira who are following a woman who calls herself a prophet. She must be a member of the church, we think, but she's leading members astray. She is teaching them that it's okay to participate in pagan rituals. It's okay to eat food that is dedicated to idols or to participate in sexual immorality. This is what we've heard before in the church in Pergamum. And to this situation, Christ says the ultimate put down. She describes the woman Jezebel. And we remember back in 1 Kings 16 of King Ahab, a wicked king, and his wicked wife Jezebel, who taught the Hebrews the religion of Baal, which taught eating meat of idols and sexual promiscuity. You've even heard that phrase, which is a modern put-down for someone. She's a a Jezebel of a woman. Same thing happening right here. Now this is a deep theological issue, but it also comes with economic consequences. The trade guilds were like our modern labor unions, but they also included social and um, labor issues and religious issues all in one gathering. They also had 
banquet that everyone who is a member would participate in. And when you were there, you obviously participated fully by having the food that has been dedicated to a certain god, a pagan ritual, and you were expected to have a good time afterwards like everyone did, either in sexual immorality or participating in the prostitutes of the temple. Now the Christians who chose not to participate in these rituals, they could be expelled and were from the guild. They could lose their job. It hit them where it hurts most, their pocketbook. Not participating fully in a trade guild was economic suicide. Every follower in Thyatira had to make a choice. Jesus or career. Jesus or my job. That's what they're up against. Now, generations of Christians have had similar decisions, sometimes severe, sometimes on a daily basis. How far do you accept, adopt, support, contribute contemporary practices that are beyond our moral understanding? Cultural, cultural mores, which we've understood were not ethically acceptable in the church. How far do you go? Where's the line? Is there a line that you shouldn't cross in these kinds of applications? By now, after we've read a series of these letters, you see a pattern developing, and you remember there's a certain phrase in each letter that says, but to the one who is victorious. Sometimes it says, to the one who conquers. And it's a consistent theme in every single letter it says that. But in this letter, Christ adds, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end. He's highlighting a direct contrast between his will and her doings. Jezebel, the woman Jezebel. Many times in our lives we have to make a choice. For some of it, it's, it's every day. A decision to live out our faith, a decision of doing Christ's will to the very end. Two rewards are promised to the ones who will do this, to the ones who will conquer. First, they will share in Christ's authority over the nations, and they will be given the morning star, which is a beautiful metaphor of the dawn of a new day. Now, you and I know that the morning star is actually a planet called Venus. But at that time, it was called the morning star, and it was seen as ultimate authority because it announced the dawn of a new day, the fulfillment of hope after the dark night had passed. And if, if you have read to the end of the chapter, like our choir was so beautifully singing of the vision toward the end, but in chapter 22, John writes, where the Lord describes himself as the bright morning star. So in pledging to give the morning star to the conquerors in this letter, Christ is promising to them and to us who will endure, I will give you myself. He's calling us to value him more than anything else. Because someday we will receive the ultimate reward to be with our Lord forever. This letter to Thyatira offers us this powerful promise. To the one who does my will to the end, I will give you myself. Let's travel about 30 miles further south to a junction in five, uh, where five roads come together, actually. So here's Thyatira. Thank you, John, for this. Here's Sardis, right here. So that's where we're at, we're at Sardis. Sardis is a fascinating city. Sardis is the Las Vegas of modern times. 
What happens in Sardis stays in Sardis. I think they have that in Greek somewhere. Have you heard the phrase, rich as Croesus? Have you heard that phrase? The 6th century BC king who amassed such a tremendous wealth of treasures, he lived in Sardis. Of the seven, well, let's see, let's look at a few things. So that Sardis is, let me go backwards. Sardis is, uh, this is actually, uh, it's an American archaeology group from, from several decades, a couple of universities have rebuilt, this is a, a Roman gymnasium right here, we'll go up to that. So you're coming up down this street here, and all of these little cubbies are homes or little shops because of the trades that they were a part of. And so here is one particular shop right here that you go in through the door, and this is the shop, and it has all kinds of little proofs of why this was a certain kind of shop. It tells you there. See these crosses right here? Do a little close-up right there of those crosses. This was a... Um, um, a Christian lived in this shop, which, as you know from the experiences of all these cities, was um, difficult to live your faith. We go to the end of that, turn around, and there we go into a very large synagogue. We're going to go all the way down to the end, that table there, but beautiful mosaics that they've uncovered in this synagogue. Here's looking down, uh, in, that was a foyer, and this is the actual Synagogue. This is um, a very wealthy, very large synagogue in Sardis. Huge population of Jews. And this is turning around, looking backwards. And this is probably where the Torah was kept in, in these places. They look like thrones. They're not. It's where the word uh, in Hebrew was kept. And just beautiful mosaics. I just wanted to show you a couple of them. That these are um, uh, all geometric designs, you, you couldn't have idolatry in, in terms of design. You would never see a picture of a face, for instance. Just geometry is what you'll normally see on there. And this is um, a table that they've resurrected, uh, yours truly right there. But look on the end of this table. <laughs> this is a symbol of Rome right on the table. These Jews were capitulating in their faith. On the pillars were their names in Greek, not Hebrew, which is very telling because names in Hebrew were very important to the personhood of the individual. And so you're seeing a community by their architecture that their compromising part of their faith. They're melding into the community of the Romans. There's a, a Didi and me in front of the big, this is the front of that um, gym, Roman gymnasium that I told you about. And on the other side of it is the, uh, the bath. You know, the baths were very important at that time. Tremendous technology, great uh, uh, aqueduct systems. We were having our devotional right there. I thought you'd like that. Anybody want to guess what that is? You're right, the bathroom, uh, right there. But I did want to show you this view. So we're sitting there in the, at the devotional time, not this mountain, this mountain oh, right there. That mountain is going to be very important because that's where Croesus, the king, the rich king, built a tremendous fortress. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So let's now read the text from Sardis. And again, it's on your bulletin or up above. It's actually on the back of your bulletin. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. 
Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my God and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Sardis. Sardis is <clears throat> the church that receives the most severe condemnation. Jesus says they are living off their past reputation, having a name of being alive, but in fact they are dead. No condemnation could be sharper than saying from Jesus that they are dead in their faith. The church was an example of what we might call nominal Christianity, of being nominal Christians. Nominal Christians are by name only. Nominal Christians handle sacred things in an offhanded manner. Nominal Christians are the whatever of today's modern apathy. And what does Christ say to them? He commands them, wake up! Significant that twice in the history of this town, it was captured because the guards fell asleep. Situated on that almost impregnable hill that I pointed out to you, it's 1,500 feet above the valley be below. Three sides of it are almost straight up. And twice they suffered humiliating defeats because of neglect of the guards. That'll cost you a dollar. King Croesus, very interesting story. So King Croesus is the Jeff Bezos of, modern, of ancient times, right? The wealthiest man in the world. He built this huge fortification. And, and Cyrus of Persia came to lay siege, couldn't overcome it. Stayed there, stayed there, couldn't overcome it. One day, one of his soldiers, looking up at a soldier of Croesus, saw that that soldier dropped his helmet. And as he was watching, the soldier departed behind the wall. And then a few minutes later, he saw the soldier come through a hidden door pick up his helmet, and go back in through the hidden door. And he went and told his boss. And his boss said, I got a new plan. He took all of his army and went around to the other side of Sardis and, and distracted Croesus while his special forces unit went in through the trap door and took over the whole city. Just when the Sardinians thought they were safe, they were not. Now Christ begins this letter with five staccato imperatives. Wake up, strengthen what remains, remember, obey, repent. He wanted to wake them up out of their apathy. And if they didn't, he'd come like a thief not referring to the second coming of a thief in the night. He knew the Sardinians, knew their history. They knew exactly what he was talking about. They would sneak in through the trap door. To the faithful Jew, those victorious over their nominal Christianity, Christ promises three things. First, they will be dressed in white which even today is a symbol of purity. Back then it was a symbol of triumph and victory. That's all of the victors from battles were dressed in white. Secondly, and this is an interesting promise because it's phrased in a negative manner. I will not blot out your name from the book of life. Now in ancient cities, 
the practice was that every person in the census had their name in a book, and when you died, or if you committed an act of treason, your name was erased out of the book. All through Judaism, they understood this concept. You can see it in Moses, you can see it in Daniel, this idea that God has a book of life. Even in the New Testament, Jesus, Paul, and John talk about some kind of a book of life. The final promise to those who are victorious, Christ says, I will confess your name. I will acknowledge your name before my Father and before his angels. Which is a wonderful promise that stirs up our memories from the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus repeats this same pronouncement when he says, Whoever acknowledges me, acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And so as you prepare your hearts to receive communion, to declare your faith in Jesus Christ, to be victorious in declaring who he is in your life, remember what you can learn from Thyatira. To the one who does my will to the end, I will give you myself. And from the letter of Sardis, remember those five imperatives. Wake up, strengthen what... Re what remains, remember, obey, and repent. And his promise, I will confess your name to my Father and to his angels. When we take communion, we're declaring what we believe. We're declaring that this act is set apart. We have baptism, we have communion. Those two sacraments are declarations of Jesus being Lord and Savior in our lives. We live in a community where Christians are becoming more and more a minority. So you can learn from these cities because they were in a minority. We might not lose our job. We might not be put to death. But we have decisions to make. And so we're making that right now in the comfort of this beautiful sanctuary. But it's to also feed our soul as a spiritual banquet to give us strength to lay that claim in our workforce, in our home life, and wherever we live to the end, doing Jesus' will.